Welcome to Unearthed, the podcast where we unearth golden insights from across the industry. I'm Joe Cavatoni, Senior Market Strategist for the Americas at the World Gold Council. And I'm John Reed, Senior Market Strategist for the World Gold Council for Europe and Asia. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Randy Smallwood, CEO and President of Wheaton Precious Metals and former Chair of the World Gold Council. A pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Joe and John. So, Randy, for the benefits of our listeners who may not really understand how a company like Wheaton Precious Metals works, could you explain your business model? Sure. Uh, well, I'm a geological engineer that actually came from the mining industry, so I did have the, the benefits of uh, being part of an exploration team that successfully identified and, and then developed and uh, ran through the feasibility study and constructed and then operated and was actually a mine manager for a while at a small but very profitable very important uh, quality, uh, gold mine in, in northern Canada. Um, and I always remember uh, we had a little, uh, I had a royalty on that, that <laughs> project, and, and it was never an enjoyable experience. I'd get a call every three, three months from the royalty owner saying, where's my check? And once a year, he'd send in an auditor, and we'd argue about what was on his land and what wasn't, right? So, so um, somehow we kind of got into the space, but you know, 20 years ago, we started uh, what was then Silver Wheat, and we focused on the silver space originally. Uh, now Wheat and Precious Metals, and we decided we're gonna try and change that industry um, with what we call streaming. And streaming is a much more partnership-focused uh, uh, approach to working with the operators. And what we do, is quite simply, is supply capital for a percentage, and typically of a non-core byproduct. What we what we realize is that a lot of copper mines around the world produce gold mm. as a byproduct. A lot of lead zinc mines around the world produce silver as a byproduct. Those copper mines are run by copper mining companies, base metal companies, not really all that interested in the precious metal space. And um, so essentially, you know, one of the one of the functional laws of effective portfolio management is is looking at you know crystallizing value out of your non-core assets within your portfolio. Precious metals byproduct production typically is a non-core asset within a base metal operation. Yet you know, 20% of the world's gold comes as a byproduct from copper, copper assets. 75% of the world's silver comes as a byproduct from non, you know, from non-silver mines. Yeah. So that's our market. That's what we chase is we try and liberate that, that precious metal production from those base metal operations and bring it out to precious metal shareholders. And so the, the, the structure we have is, is streaming. It's a very efficient, um, uh, business model. Uh, we have 40 employees and for a company that's in excess of 20 billion in market mm -hmm. cap, trades on London Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, we supply capital to the industry. Yeah, it's certainly been very successful. And as you say, you're celebrating your 20th anniversary this year. So mm -hmm. congratulations on that. We've been attending the PDAC conference, the Prospectors Developers Association of Canada here in Toronto. And I guess we should lead off with the price of gold, which continues to hit a series of all-time highs uh, at the start of March. Any thoughts on what's going on at the moment, Randy? Well, it's been a long time since I've uh, been to a conference where PDAC have, have been coming here for what, 20 plus years. And to have record prices in the gold sector is exciting. Uh, but to see so many down and out companies out there trying to look for equity support is, uh, you know, the, the contradiction there is actually a uh, is a bit, uh, you know, the, just the contrast in that. Uh, we should all be celebrating in terms of the uh, gold demand, gold pricing, but we're still not seeing that uh, investor coming into the space. Yeah, it's a real contrast. When, when, when I attend precious metals conferences rather than mining equity conferences, it's a very different feel to what you, what, what, what you experience when you're at, uh, uh, at a mining, a predominantly mining event such as this. Um, I think that the, the fact that gold has done so well this year has, has been a real surprise, I think, to many people. Um, I was tweeting out a couple of weeks ago just saying you couldn't keep a, a good metal down. Uh, gold had dipped briefly below $2,000 an ounce, but it bounced straight back up again. And I think that's what set us up yeah. for this move to the all-time highs. You know, your, your point's are a good one, Randy. We were chatting a little earlier about the investment demand. One of the things that we are seeing, though, and actually I think the thing that's actually surprising on the investment side has been the hold of investment allocations on a dollar value. Mm -hmm. So the price is performing well. The flows into the investment community have been a little bit tapered, mm -hmm. institutionally in particular. 
But we're seeing that allocations and hearing from clients that they aren't lowering allocations. They might be holding off adding to. And that's actually been an interesting dynamic. I think it speaks a lot about the fact that events in the market, price performance that has been you know, really special, um, keeps them involved in the metal. They can't keep it down. And actually, they keep it in the portfolio for now. Well, Joe, as you know, uh, our, our business uh, at Wheaton Precious Metals is supplying capital to the mining industry. And, uh, and um, you know, uh, we can't be the only source of capital, but boy, it sure feels like we are when it, when it comes to the, the crowds around us looking for it. And so, so you know, uh, there's definitely the, the, the price is reflecting that, that uh, you know, that, that appetite. But it just hasn't made it back to the investing public, especially on the mining sector, mm -hmm. in terms of the companies that actually produce this gold that uh, that we all need, and uh, and uh, and so uh, I'm I'm hungry for that that <laughs> that that change in that in, in, in appetite. Um, let's bring it on. Yeah. Although it must be quite nice to be in the position where you are, you know, in a category that is the unique supplier of capital to the market. It must make you the most popular person at PDAC. <laughs> yes, there's uh, there's lots of appetite for financing out there right now, and and, and we're, we're one of the few options. So turning to the gold market rather than the, the gold equity market for a moment, um, what's impressed you about gold demand? over the last couple of years? What's really stood out to you in terms of the, uh, the, the constituents of the overall market? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's clear that central banks have been uh, you know, really stepping up um, in a number of different, different jurisdictions around the world. And, and the discussions that, that you know, we hear on, on BRIC, um, the only alignment that we see in BRIC is a lack of appetite for the US dollar. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that takes some very diverse countries, economies, politics, uh, cultures, and blends them all together. And the only constant amongst that entire group of, of BRIC nations is, is a dislike of the US dollar and a distrust of the US dollar. And, uh, and so the, the, you know, the combined appetite from, from the BRIC nations combined with uh, you know, a number of central banks deciding that instead of having US dollars as part of their core reserves, it's time to start shifting that into gold. And I really do think when you sit and look at the market, it, it just fits. Um, you know, as you know, we're, we're both, we're, you know, wheat and precious metals is focused on gold and silver mm. and a few other metals, but pre predominantly gold and silver. And when I look at silver and how it's reacting right now, it's, it's hanging pretty flat. It's, mm. uh, it hasn't had that move and, and in fact, dramatically being outperformed by gold. Um, central banks rarely buy silver as, as part of their reserves. And, and I think that even, you know, reinforces the fact that the, the driving force behind the gold price right now is central bank buying. Uh, we're seeing ETFs falling off. We're seeing the equities, of course, uh, uh, not, not doing all that well, not a lot of support. At some point, the rest of the population needs to understand and, 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 and learn what, what the economists that work for these central banks have all learned, which is it's time to start shifting. Yeah, it's certainly been a big contributor to, to the strength in gold over, over the last 18, 24 months. Um, the fact that central bank purchases basically doubled in 2022 and retains that, that very strong momentum in 2023 is probably the reason why the gold price didn't come lower. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, um, the gold market had some real headwinds in theory in the last couple of years. All these interest rate hikes we've seen around the world um, and the fact that the US dollar was strong uh, by some measures at a 20 year high uh, at some points last year. Yet gold has held up really well mm -hmm. and has gone on to make new highs and central banks are certainly part of that. Right. I think the challenge for gold in the risk appetite right now is against the risk assets. The, what you can yield in cash, what you can see in the bond market, what the equity markets in developed equity markets have been doing, mm -hmm. that's put the headwinds on the gold market. Mm -hmm. But what you're citing in terms of the central bank community, it's a more diverse, complex uh, approach to owning gold in the portfolio. It's diversification against the dollar. Mm -hmm. It's diversification against the fiscal risk of the US and what they're holding in, terms of, in the form of treasuries. I think it also comes into a bit around geopolitics, mm -hmm. borders, the potential for impact of actions on the part of the U.S. and other nations when it comes to sanctions. So there's a lot of the underlying current there that's actually diversifying these emerging market central banks in particular, right. yep. away from the dollar and also away from the euro. And John talked about the last two years being record or near record. It's been a 14-year trend mm -hmm. and it just continues. Mm -hmm. I mean, that environment is ripe for it. And that, I think, is why we keep seeing the price held up quite firm. 
at that 1900 level, if not higher, because yeah. the central banks continue to see a need in the portfolio. And it's creating an opportunity too, an opportunity for the mining industry, because these higher prices should deliver better results for the, the few investors that they do have, the few <laughs> shareholders they do have. And if you want to attract new shareholders, the best way to do that is to deliver on performance. And so um, gold is delivering what it needs to in terms of higher prices for, for the mining invest, you know, mining investments, the, the, the mining companies, the streaming companies. And now it's our turn to sort of make sure that we deliver those enhanced returns back to our, to our stakeholders and, and ensuring that, that we can. So um, the market is right for it. It is definitely right for it. So when you talk to the investors here at PDAC, do you find it harder for them to understand what's happening in the metals markets right now? Is it easier for them to grasp gold, but maybe wrestle with silver, platinum, palladium? Yeah. How do you see the dynamic in the conversation with well, them? Well, I mean, you mentioned the silver. Um, you know, one of the questions we do get quite a bit, you know, about 35% of our revenue comes from silver. So in terms of silver exposure, we're still actually probably one of the better names to invest into to get silver exposure. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt there are some of our shareholders that that are that own Wheaton to, to have that silver exposure along with everything else. Yeah, we do get asked a lot why silver hasn't moved, especially with the increasing um, you know uh, consumption demand, the increasing push on on uh, on um, you know high efficiency electronics and antibacterial applications, you know solar panels and and and, and such. Uh, you know more well well over half, you know probably close to two thirds of silver is now being consumed. Mm -hmm. um, why hasn't it moved? Why hasn't it moved? And, and again, I think it's just that that we're not seeing um, that same support that gold's getting from from central banks. But uh, silver has always traditionally lagged gold, um, but it also outperforms. It's also you know it's a high beta. It's it's got high beta. It's, I always caution everyone that it outperforms on the way up. It also outperforms <laughs> on the way down. That's the way beta works, right? Yeah. And so you do have to get your timing right. But, uh, you know, it always lags gold, and we have seen gold moving. Um, I, I do think what's unique about gold moving this time is that it's really coming, I think, from one source. Um, but that one source, I think, is, is has a great ability to become contagious sure. and to spread out amongst that. And so so that's the that's the questions we're getting from 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 investors is, is um, you know, uh, uh, you know where, where do we see silver? Where do we see the other commodities coming? When are they going to wake up and move the way uh, gold prices are? Sure. One of the things I, I, I no longer cover silver like I used to. I mean, when I was at, uh, at, at previous jobs, I spent quite a bit of time looking at the silver market. Um, I always think of it as a mixture in terms of its drivers. It's a mixture of gold and, it, and copper. Yeah. And obviously gold's doing really well at the moment. Um, and, and, and partly because of the, the central bank story, but there are other strong buyers out there too. Um, but if you look at the copper price, it's been a bit weak. It's been a bit weak as, as the Chinese economy is uh, struggling in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, personally, um, I, I pay a lot of attention to silver and particularly the gold-silver ratio because it tells me a lot about both markets. And the fact that gold is outperforming silver to such an extent at the moment is a confirmation of the importance of the central bank story. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, a, as you say, silver lagging at the moment when we see a reacceleration in the global economy, perhaps after a recession, perhaps after a soft landing, whatever happens, um, then I think the potential for silver to outperform is certainly there. Yeah, I, I, would, I would simply say that silver where it is right now is, is, uh, is there because of that industrial demand, which mm. is a very firm base, mm. uh, a very solid base. And so the upside potential on silver is dramatically stronger than the downside risk. Mm. Um, so it's not a bad commodity to, to, to be considering in these, in these times. But you know it's not going to move until we see that that retail investor that um, you know some of the institutions stepping into the broader precious metal space. Right, that will come. So we we our outlook for twenty twenty four talked about hard landing, soft landing, and some of us advocated for a lack of clarity, no landing for a period of time. And in your conversations with investors, um, does that resonate more so, or what other topics resonates most with them when it comes to the decision? on getting involved in a project or how they're looking at your business and its involvement in a project? Well, there's, there's no doubt, um, you know, one of the driving forces behind most precious metal um, investors is, is the safe haven concept, mm -hmm. right? And so um, the, the concept of hard landing versus soft landing versus further confusion uh, definitely plays a role in that. And that's one of the questions that we do, uh, we do uh, get from investors. Um, you know, from my perspective, I think they're running out of band-aids. 
<laughs> like it's just getting tougher and tougher and that's what I feel. And so, so my own feeling is that we are going to have continued confusion because they still have band-aids. They're going to come up with temporary solutions, temporary pushes to try and support certain, certain aspects of it. But, but you know, um, I just, I do feel like we're running short on that front. And so, so, you know, when I'm talking to the investors, you know, one of the things that I do like to talk about is, is, is the whole concept, the challenges of, of what it takes to actually bring these products to, to, um, to market. Um, you know, when I, when I sit and see, um, you know, we're in an interesting perspective, our business in, in the sense that we supply capital, usually at the development stage, at the construction stage, but so much work has to be done to get a project to that level. Mm -hmm. And, and what we've seen is, uh, is a dramatic decline in the number of opportunities that we look at just over the last four or five years. And, and, and all of this spells back to the fact that we're not seeing risk investors coming in and looking. And it, there's no doubt there's higher risk, but with success, very high rewards. We're not seeing anywhere near as many um, uh, early stage uh, investors coming into the space to fund that early stage exploration. And, and that's gonna wind up um, you know, causing a challenge in terms of supply, in terms of bringing in uh, metals to replace what we're consuming. And we're seeing it because we funded at the development stage. And, and I, I will tell you that, you know, 80 years, or no, what, 80 years, uh, four years ago, we put out over 80 proposals in the year. Last year, we put out 20. Wow. That's quite a drop in terms of the number of opportunities out there that are looking for that. Um, and so, you know, it's been continually declining all the way along. And so I, I do think that what we're seeing is something that's going to work its way all the way up through the whole system and impact the supply side. And, and the other challenges that we've seen in that space. I mean, you can see it actually, if you look at global mine production, we saw rapid increases in mine production between 2008 to the peak that we saw in 2018. Mm -hmm. But now we haven't managed to get through that, uh, that previous all time high uh, in terms of mine supply um, back in 2018. There might be the prospects of a bit of growth coming through this year or next year. But standing back from that, the fact that gold's above two thousand dollars an ounce hitting a series of all-time highs and yet the, the gold mining industry can't grow mm -hmm. it really shows you the shortages of opportunities that are out there now we don't forecast mine production but we rely on uh, partners that do and and they point to, to a production cliff um, that is faced by many of the producers such that five to ten years down the line we're just not getting the projects approved and built <laughs> to replace um, uh, what will be probably going off stream. John, have you tried permitting a mine lately? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, yeah. the, the challenges of permitting around this world, and it's, it's, it's every jurisdiction around the world, like, it's getting more and more challenging. Even, even we at Wheaton have had to reshape the way we do our due diligence, and we now have a social scientist mm. as part of our due diligence team that spends time with communities to make sure that we're comfortable that there's good support in those communities. Because if you don't have strong social license, if you don't have acceptance, and it's, and it's not so much... It's not much, it's not like checking off the list saying, ah, oh, Chile's got good regulations. Mm -hmm. No, it's the local communities. Yeah. Um, this is a society that I think through the, through the, through the use of, of media and the accessibility of media, everyone's got a voice. And so you've got to make sure that you, you have that strong support. You've got to make sure you get the information out there that, that outlines the benefits of, of whatever project you're working on and get that support because it is so tough to permit projects and even through the construction phase, you can, you can run into challenges if you right. don't have that strong community support. So 80 proposals down to 20. Yeah. Well, part of that was by self-selection or was that partly because they were standing a pipeline? Uh, no, no, it's uh, our standards uh, are, haven't changed over right. that period of time. It's the, the, the there's the that, lack of that much fewer. Yeah, it's a lack of projects, lack of quality projects, mm. right? We are very selective of what we invest into. We're always looking for assets that have high operating margins. Right. We're seeing a, a dearth of those. We're, we're seeing that dramatically drop off. There's just not as many new projects coming into play. Right. So thinking about what we're seeing here at PDAC, is anything resonating from a technology perspective that might change that dynamic for the small startup or the small project that needs funding but needs to do it more efficiently? Is there anything that's sticking out? Or are you guys looking at that space as well to see how that could help? To well, create more field right? automation and AI um, will will help, um, which is good because we're also running into a huge 
um, qualified staff mm. uh, challenge in this industry. Interesting. Just about every mining school in the world has dramatically dropped in terms of geologists, engineers, metallurgists. Uh, some of the some of the most esteemed schools in the world have now collapsed into the chemistry department yeah. or the civil engineering department, and uh, um, and and so. You know the average age of 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 workers in the mining industry is is in the fifties. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact number, but it's it's an age that's not far off of retirement, and um, and there's not a lot of people coming into the space afterwards. And so so we do need technology to sort of step up and try and improve efficiencies because we're not going to have the same you know, capacity from a from a from a manpower perspective or a human power perspective sure. to to uh, to to you know move these projects forward. And so. So yeah, here at PDAC, you know, some of the most impressive things I've seen is on the exploration side, uh, a little bit of machine learning, and, and that's actually an area where I think there's there's some pretty big broad databases. There's probably is some 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 efficiencies in terms of AI and getting getting a bit more efficient and targeting your exploration efforts and. Um, um, you know, there's all sorts of, I, I wandered the floor yesterday morning and there's all sorts of uh, new technologies out there for trying to improve blast efficiency mm. and, and cutting down the energy consumption during the whole communition process. And there's lots of great technologies coming in uh, uh, and all of those will help in terms um, but, you know, it, this is a business of constant improvement. Right. Uh, there's always got to be a better way. Our guest, Randy Smallwood, used the term communication. John, maybe you can help our listeners understand what he meant by that. Sure, Joe. So, comminution simply means crushing and grinding rocks, taking large rocks that are blasted or excavated and then grinding them up and crushing them down so that gold can be extracted. It's a term that you may not have heard before uh, and one I thought worth explaining. So, winding up, have you got a fun fact you'd like to share about gold or precious metals, Joe? What have you got for me? Well, I do. So um, it's just something very funny that's happened over the last couple of weeks. There's been ongoing interest about the announcement that Costco made. Probably, oh, yeah. They probably made it and didn't realize what kind of excitement that would come along with it because it was roughly $100 million worth of earnings from selling gold in physical form through Costco. And I think if you speak to their CFO, he'd probably regret having mentioned it. <laughs> I had more questions on that than anything else. <laughs> Pales in comparison to the size of Costco's quarterly earnings. Mm -hmm. But it is an interesting point to bring up because I think it highlights something that doesn't get as much attention in the US as maybe it should, which is bar and coin demand is actually hitting record levels. And while it is not as well publicized and understood as the ETF market. It is a segment of the investment area where we continue to see retail investors picking up physical gold. Now, the reason I bring all of that up is because I was hemming and hawing over having to answer a few questions from a journalist at home. And my wife said, I bought some gold from Costco. And I didn't even know she did. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's worth highlighting the fact that Costco is one of the most trusted retail names mm -hmm. in terms of quality uh, in a broad base through through North America, and and it kind of underscores, I think, one of the opportunities that we have, the World Gold Council has, the gold industry has, yeah. if we can elevate the level of trust around mm -hmm. gold. 100%. Um, to have a look at what what happened at Costco. So you can you can get gold from Costco. You can get it through eBay. You can get it through Amazon. You can get it through trusted retailers. All the work we're doing to get mm -hmm. to continue to improve the space. So yeah, it's really mm -hmm. it is uh, an area where I think the market needs to have a better understanding as well that there is consumption that's taking place. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, um, I'm I'm not criticizing people for looking at the ETFs because there's lots of data available and you can get every day the changes in holdings um, of gold that's owned by ETFs. But put it into perspective, um, we saw around 244 tons of, of redemptions or selling from gold ETFs last year, but coin and small investment bar demand totaled 1,200 tons. Mm. So we don't talk enough about the physical buying uh, that takes place in the market of people buying from Costco or from their local gold retailer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we perhaps spend a bit too much time talking about the financial flows associated with ETFs. Mm -hmm. Fun fact, John? Yeah. 
My fun fact on gold is that it is so flexible and malleable that you can actually take gold and turn it into a thread, which can be then used in embroidery. <laughs> I've met a firm that does do that. <laughs> <laughs> and where are they? They're based in Mount Vernon, New York. I right. just met them at a regional IPMI conference. <laughs> yeah. I was surprised to hear that. Do you have a fun fact to share with us, Randy? You know, I just finished, uh, as mentioned, three years as the chair of the World Gold mm. Council, and uh, and part of the uh, one of the privileges that you get representing um, the World Gold Council is attending some of the COP conferences. Mm. Um, you know, big uh, big conferences uh, uh, on on basically the environment, and and um, you know, as representing sort of a, a mining centric uh, uh, advocacy group, kind of puts you in a unique position whenever you're at one of these conferences, and mm. and so I had. It was actually truly a, a, a good experience to sit on a couple of panels with, with some critics or some uh, sure. some uh, you know some objective uh, questions tossed our way in, and I, I, I really uh, it was on a panel with um, someone from the aluminum industry, from from the cement industry, someone from the uh, steel industry, and I think there was another rep from the uh, uh, zinc industry, and and one of the questions came up was about circularity, mm. which is a phrase that I hadn't really focused on much before from from our perspective. But circularity represents um, how how effectively a product, once it's produced and extracted from from a mine, how effectively is it recycled? Does it get recycled a lot? And and of course, each each of uh, the peers on the panel were talking about. In the cement industry, there is a measure of recycling in terms of, uh, but but not very high. It's a very low number. Uh, of course, copper is definitely higher. Lead, zinc is higher. Aluminum was doing really well. They were talking about progress in terms of you know uh, packaging and stuff like this. And I'm of course there representing the gold industry. And um, um, the more I thought about it, the more I think you know I think I think we are leading by example in terms of uh, uh, we have 100% circularity in the gold industry. Mm -hmm. And, and it was something that I'd never really heard presented or, or put out before. So, so I laid it out and of course there was a few expressions of surprise and I said, it doesn't get wasted. Mm. Very, you know, very, very minute amounts, possibly in some electrical waste, but, but I'm not confident, you know, I'm, I'm confident that that will ultimately be sure. recovered anyways. Um, but, uh, but gold is not wasted. When we mine it, it gets used and it never gets wasted. And I, I just, uh, it's something to keep in mind. It's the most effective of all the, of all the minerals that get extracted from this planet. And, and there's a lot of them. Gold is the most efficiently used once it's mined. Yeah, you don't chuck it away, not deliberately at Never. Least. Yeah, exactly. And, and when you do chuck it away, there'll be someone there to find it. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes, so. Well, thanks for that, Randy. Yeah. Well, I think that brings our conversation pretty much to an end. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of the World Gold Council and on the behalf of the listeners of Unearthed for joining us today. Randy Smallwood, CEO and President of Wheaton Precious Metals. Thank you. A true pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thanks to all of our listeners for joining us today on this special Unearthed podcast with Randy Smallwood. You can find our podcasts where you find all your podcasts, and we look forward to you joining us on a monthly basis.